Welcome to Questions in Physics. My name is Joseph Cianciamino. As this is my favorite subject, today I want to cover the history and nature of time. Keep in mind that I'll be focusing on the relevance to time in these theories that I'll be discussing. There's a ton of information to cover, and even still I'm condensing this to a very short and simple overview. I will note that I'm going to omit the common explanations found in most other videos of this subject. To me, it seems that most videos tend to spend most of the time explaining the mechanics of what they are trying to explain, and spend very little time explaining what they are actually trying to say. I think most viewers interested in this topic would already have the basic understanding needed, but there are plenty of videos out there to explain the common things such as light codes should you feel lost. In this particular video, I will mainly cover history, so there will not be any diagrams or equations. But before we begin, I need to find some specific terminology I will be using for clarification. Age, or aging. This is what we normally refer to as time, the passage of time with the ticking of a clock. I made this distinction to avoid confusion, since in this reference the word time has a different meaning. Arrow of time. This is the measure of entropy, that we can remember the past, but we cannot remember the future. Space-time. The specific relationship between time and space as described in the special and general theories of relativity. Space-time interval. Due to the special theory of relativity, two events and two different time frames cannot always be agreed upon as being simultaneous when witnessed by two different observers. This is a method to give a global view regardless of time dilation. Imaginary time. Coined by Stephen Hawking, this is the concept of alternate timelines parallel to our own. Time. The more general umbrella term referring to the combination of all the effects mentioned above. Galileo Galilei. The earliest works related to time was in the study of motion. Time itself was considered to be a singular without any attribute other than to be a constant. Galileo was perhaps the first to define what we call the inertial frame reference. In his book called The Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems of 1632, he described what he called invariance. Using the example of a ship on a smooth sea, moving at a constant velocity, without rocking, any observer below the deck would not be able to tell whether the ship was moving or stationary. So while you sit here watching this, in your own reference, you were stationary, not moving. Yet you are on the Earth, which is rotating and orbiting the Sun, and the Sun is orbiting the Milky Way galaxy. But for all intents and purposes, you are stationary within your own inertial frame. Isaac Newton Continuing the work of Galileo, Newton's work on gravity in the Philosophe Naturalis Principia Mathematica of 1686 laid the foundation of how we first began to think about space-time. In this worldview, space and time were separate from one another, yet both were static and unchanging. Events were considered to be simultaneous to all observers. The forces of nature, such as gravity and magnetism, were thought to be instantaneous. Albert Michelson and Edward Morley In 1887, Michelson and Morley performed what is known as the Michelson-Morley experiment. At that time, light was thought to only be a wave, and so they were searching for evidence of the medium which wave could propagate through. At the time, this was thought to be a fluid they called the luminiferous ether. They were looking for a change in the speed of light as the Earth rotates, but they did not find that the motion of the Earth added nor subtracted to the observed speed. Hendrik Lorentz Working with George Fitzgerald on the concept of inertial frame reference in relationship to the results of the Michelson-Morley experiment, they discovered some inconsistencies with the Galilean transformation formula in respect to the observed velocity of light. To bring the formula into agreement with observation, they made changes to the formula to better fit the observed data. The result of this brought the concept that distance would dilate with velocity. 
So as one would expect the motion of the Earth to subtract to the observed speed of light passing by it, the measurement of the distance would be distorted in relationship to the speed, thus for the observer the speed of light remains unchanged. This was then published in 1892 under the title Fitzgerald Lorentz Contraction Hypothesis. Lorentz continued this research with Joseph Lamour and Henry Poincaré to discover that these transformations could also affect time, which the results were published in 1905. It is not well documented, and I'm mostly speaking from memory, but this is roughly about when time was first beginning to be thought of as being the fourth dimension. Many had wanted to use trigonometry to resolve some of these equations. It is that in applied physics, trigonometry is considered to have a higher degree of accuracy as compared to Pythagorean theorem. However, for trigonometry to be successful, they must first define the right angle of time in relationship to space. As no agreement could be made that time was a dimension at all, much less to have an agreement as to where the right angle of time was to be set, this resulted in that only Pythagorean theorem was to be accepted into the research of space-time. Albert Einstein Working with very similar theories regarding the results of the Michelson-Morley experiment, Einstein noted inconsistencies in Maxwell's equations on electromagnetism. Finding much the same results as Lorentz with regards to the dilation of space and time in relationship to velocity, he published his findings under the title of On the Electrodynamics of Moving Bodies. This too was also published in 1905, only a few months after Lorentz. There is some debate in history as to wonder if Einstein plagiarized some of the work of Lorentz. However, the main difference being that Einstein no longer saw space and time as two separate entities. This later became known as the Special Theory of Relativity. Hermann Minkowski In 1907, Minkowski continued with Special Relativity in that the theory can be described geometrically as the fourth dimension and published his works on Minkowski space-time. However, what most fail to note is that while relativity can be modeled in higher dimensional space-time, there was never a geometric proof as to where the right angle of space-time lies, or if there is a whole dimension, a fractorial dimension, or even multiple dimensions. As such, trigonometry is still not to be used within the accepted theories of relativity. Time being the fourth dimension simply remains a de facto standard and has never been fully proven within the realm of geometry. Later, in 1915, Einstein published the General Theory of Relativity, in which in regards to the study of time, it was discovered that gravity was equivalent to acceleration. As such, gravitational fields would also dilate space and time just the same way as velocity. This is the foundation of space-time. Niels Bohr Bohr had heavily influenced Einstein and, beginning in 1925, continued on to found the Copenhagen interpretation, which helped form the basis of quantum mechanics. However, it should also be noted that when we speak of the accepted theories of relativity, we are referring to the end result of the Copenhagen interpretation rather than the original theories as stated by Einstein. While Einstein was concerned about the mechanics of how the cosmos worked, Bohr had taken a different approach in that he focused only on the calculated predicted results of what an observer will witness. So for example, we might commonly think of two events being simultaneous. From Einstein's perspective, such a simultaneous event when dealing with relativistic speeds could never be observed as being simultaneous due to the propagation delay of the age it takes for the light of the event to reach the observer along with any space-time violation affecting both the light propagation as well as the observer. Bohr, however, would counter-argue that since it can never be observed, it is impossible to prove that the event was ever simultaneous to begin with. From his perspective, this was merely a construct of the formulas, and it might be that reality can never be fully understood within the scope of the human intellect. I am not certain who said it first, but it's said that the universe is not required to work within the realm of human understanding. It does, however, appear to conform to the realm of mathematics. From this came the classic saying, shut up and calculate. Richard Feynman 
1947, Feynman was the first fool to accept this challenge as he attended the Shelter Island Conference where he introduced his early works on quantum electrodynamics and the use of Feynman diagrams. It is said at the end of the lecture, Bohr stood up and called him an idiot. Humiliated yet undaunted, Feynman remained at the conference and found other physicists that encouraged him to continue his research. With respect to the understanding of time, he made several advancements within quantum electrodynamics. He discovered that, at least from a mathematical sense, antimatter had the same properties of the equivalent regular matter traveling backwards in time. This gave us a better understanding of entropy and the arrow of time. In 1948, he continued his work introducing his interpretation of the path integral formulation in relation to quantum mechanics. This later became known as the sum over histories. Many would view this being similar to the many worlds theory in that it showed how multiple histories could converge into a singular future. Feynman did not take a stance being for or against this interpretation, but that such a model was mathematically equivalent and that it gave accurate predictions. Nonetheless, the proponents of many worlds interpretation nicknamed their interpretation of Feynman's work as the sum of all possible histories. Typical to Feynman, he remained with the view that it was interesting, but let us wait and see what nature has to show us. Hugh Everett in the 1950s, quantum mechanics remained a series of equations to successfully predict the potential end results of experiments in particle physics. The problem remained that there was still not an accepted understanding of the mechanics of how it operated. Furthermore, Bohr was convinced that since such events were based upon probability, they could not be related to classical mechanics, and any such attempt at explaining such was a foolish waste of time. Hugh Everett was the next fool to accept this challenge. Beginning in 1956, he wrote his Ph.D. in several papers on the subject of the theory of the universal wave function. In this, he attempted to describe the event leading up to the Big Bang using the wave function found in quantum mechanics. He further wrote the article, Wave Mechanics Without Probability, where he began to explore the potential existence of multiple timelines. With regards to the theory of time, this further led to the many worlds interpretation. Within the Copenhagen interpretation, time was linear. There is only one singular past and only one singular future. However, with the many worlds interpretation, time is described as splitting into multiple futures. At the request of John Wheeler, Everett traveled to Copenhagen to present these theories to Niels Bohr. Unfortunately for Everett, this meeting went horribly wrong as members of the Niels Bohr Institute described him as undescribably stupid and could not understand the simplest things in quantum mechanics. Disdained, Everett left the field of theoretical physics and chose a career in applied physics for the military. Stephen Hawking In 1965, working with Roger Penrose, Hawking wrote his thesis which became known as the Penrose-Hawking Singularity Theorems. This gave rise to the paradoxical understanding of singularities. Imagine if somehow you could observe an object falling past the event horizon from a God's eye view of the universe, yet still standing outside the event horizon of a black hole. As the object approaches the singularity, the gravitational forces become so great that time dilation comes into effect. In relationship to the outside of the event horizon, the object would slow down and virtually stop. Even from a God's eye view, it would take an infinite amount of time to witness the object falling into the singularity. Yet from the perspective of the object falling, it would not notice any change at all as it fell into the final void of infinity. For this and other paradoxes, Hawking would say that all black holes must remain properly clothed. The importance of this, however, was the extreme scales within these theories of black holes. It gave a framework where quantum mechanics was forced to contend with its inconsistencies in relationship to relativity. Or is it that relativity was forced to contend with quantum mechanics? If you ever thought that the rhetoric between Democrats and Republicans was bad, in the deep dark corners of universities the halls still echo at the once heated arguments between the proponents of quantum mechanics versus the proponents of relativity. While not tied to any specific year, the importance to note of Hawking's work in popularizing science brought legitimacy to the study of fringe science. 
Much of the work of Richard Feynman, Hugh Everett, and many others might have possibly ended up in the cosmic dustbin. On the issue of some of histories and the many worlds interpretation, Hawking coined the phrase imaginary time to represent alternate timelines parallel to our own. On his light cone diagrams, he would comment that the 45 degree angle was arbitrary and only used such because it simply made more sense that way. However, he continued to say that there was no proof that this was the correct angle. Some might argue that this is a reminder that time has never been geometrically proven to be the fourth dimension. Gavin Wentz As we get into the modern age, we enter the arena of experimental fringe science. However, it should be considered that all new theories, even relativity, began at the fringes of what is accepted. At the very fringe of experimental physics, we have Gavin Wentz. In 2013, he published his works on existics, which explores the potential of time needing greater than a single dimension to resolve some of the paradoxes found within temporal mechanics. In his work, he believes that it takes three dimensions to fully describe the various attributes of time. Here, I should mention that I personally am a proponent of higher dimensional time. While I do not fully agree with all of his work, I must give him credit for continuing the research into geometric proofs of dimensional time. Faye Dowker An understudy of Hawking, Dowker is currently researching the aspect of time at the quantum scale. In 2014, she published The Birth of Space-Time Atoms as the Passage of Time. Consider the Planck length, which is the smallest scale possible within our universe. Thus, the amount of time it takes for light to travel this distance is considered to be the smallest measure of time possible within our universe. Dowker raises the question of if time is continuous, or is time divided into discrete intervals. She has chosen the path to research the potential of time being discrete intervals for what she calls space-time atoms. Now, I know I have merely glossed over these theories, and there are so many other contributors Heisenberg, Pauli, Jordan, Schrodinger, Dirac, just to name a few more. The point of this, however, was to show the history of temporal mechanics and to give a better understanding of the attributes of time. Where many want to talk about what is known in science, I prefer instead to bring questions. Is time really a singular force? Or like the atom, does time have fundamental constituent parts? Is time singular and linear? Or there are many different realities constantly converging and splitting off into alternate realities? If there are alternate realities, what is the geometric nature of time? Is there specifically a fourth dimension? Since it seems that, that we can only travel in one dimension, is time a fractal dimension? Or does time have multiple dimensions? In final to this, I will quote Feynman. I think nature's imagination is so much greater than man's, she's never going to let us relax.